Welcome back, Dr. Blitz. Thanks. Happy to be here. So what I want to try to talk about today is this concept of the block universe, because it's fascinating, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And hopefully, even if it doesn't make sense, it'll be cool to be able to talk about it with somebody who understands it better than I do. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't. Well, time is hard. It's yeah, it's it's difficult. It's relative and it's difficult. So I I actually didn't even know that this was a thing until like maybe only about a year ago. Kurtz Gazat did a video that just basically talks about how the future is currently already happening and the past is also currently happening and now is an illusion and stuff like that. And I was like, what? And then I, I tried to do a little bit of a deep dive and there are just so many things about it that I have so many questions about. And uh, that's why you're here to try to help us out a little bit. Excellent. So from what I understand, um, this is, it's kind of a, a product of general relativity, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it. like you could imagine it in Galilean mechanics, but you don't need to. Yeah, because I the Kurtz Gazette video, what they said was like the whole idea of the past, present and future simultaneously exist is they said, well, according to general relativity, they sort of have to all exist. And then that's where I was like, that's a little bit weird. Um, so just for like very, very like with very basics here, just kind of if you can describe like the basic principles of general relativity and how they differ from like Newtonian mechanics or whatever you think is important. Yeah. So the way that uh, relativity, general relativity in particular, describes the universe is uh, with a mathematical structure called a manifold. Um, you don't have to worry about what that is, but you can you can think of it as just like it's like a collection of like points and places and times. But importantly, in order for that structure to make sense, you have to describe the whole thing all at once which includes all of the time, oh, not just okay. the space. So uh, the, the, the business of general relativity is that, you know, you have all of your space, you have all of your time, and the, the relationship between distances and times is not the obvious relationship you might suspect because, you know, gravity is the curvature of this space-time. So whereas you might think that there's such and such distance between two points or be such and such duration between two two times, actually, because there's mass nearby, that distance or duration is different. And that controls uh, in the same way that, you know, light always takes the shortest distance between two points. Um, that change in how we measure distances and times controls the trajectory that things take. Gravity, orbits, that, that kind of thing. That kind of thing, right. So um, I guess my next question would be, how is it that general relativity gives us this concept of, well, actually, you should probably describe what the heck the, the block universe concept even is before we, before we really jump into it. Yeah, so the idea of the block universe is, and the language is going to get really, really bad here because <laughs> the language, natural language, language is tensed. Yeah. Um, the idea of the block universe is that, um, like I said earlier, it's this idea that, well, you have all of space. You can imagine all of space just like being there. Like there's a place over there and there's a place over there. And all of those points in space, they exist now in some sense. The notion of now is also completely relative. We could talk about that too. But <laughs> the point is, is that there, there is some notion of space. But we usually think of each space becoming the next moment of space. But that's not the, that, that, that is not the only way that you can think about the universe or space time when you consider general relativity. Because like I said, you kind of have to consider the whole thing all there already in order to describe what's happening between the interactions between space and time. So you kind of have to imagine that not only is every, uh, not only is space already there is as far as like kind of determined fixed, you also have all of the trajectories of everything moving through time as well. And so you can think of it like a, a loaf of bread. Every slice is a, is a, is a, a moment in time, the slice being like the, the space. And then each subsequent slice is a different moment in time. Now, of course, the analogy breaks down because now is a very relative thing, but it gets the idea across at least. Sure. So is this really because we say like it's not 
you can't really separate space and time. It's this thing called space time. And because we wouldn't say like, well, w this space where I am exists and other spaces simultaneously exist, is that kind of why we say moments in time may all simultaneously exist? I'm hesitant to say the word simultaneously. Okay. Because simultaneously implies that there's some other notion of time where there, where like our notion of time is all happening at once. But that's not part of the, the idea is that you have structures or you, you have, for, for example, um, there is uh, there's a notion in which the, the distribution of matter and how that matter is moving is um, affects the curvature of space time. Right. And in some sense, you have to know how that matter is moving. It's not enough just to know where that matter is. You have to know how that matter is moving um, and the history of that matter and, well, depending on what kind of space time you're looking at, the future of where that matter is going to be to tell you and inform you about what the curvature of space time is. And so in some sense, you have to know information kind of about the whole thing. Now, I have to, I have to, I have to back up just a little bit. There is a notion where you can talk about like this kind of there's another notion of blo the block universe idea, which is ca called the growing block universe, where you have the past, which is all there and now, and then you evolve forward. And the, the, the future doesn't exist yet, whatever that means. Right. Um, that, that is a totally well-defined thing that you can do in, uh, in general relativity. The only reason why I hesitate to say that that's the natural thing to do is because it requires that there is some choice of what now means. And relativity says there's not a preferred choice of now. So you're a little bit stuck. Interesting. I don't know if that answered the question. <laughs> well, it, it probably does. The problem is that we're three-dimensional beings who can't even understand uh, time or whatever it is that Angel always tells me. So I have this little diagram of the block universe. And uh, we'll, I'll put it up here in the edit. So... I know you said it's not the most perfect example, and maybe this sort of implies certain things because it does have a slice that says now. And I, I thought there were some interpretations where, well, now is actually an illusion, but it's it's useful to put it there. But this is the black universe. And if you just kind of like want to talk about like, what should people think of when they see this? And hopefully that helps the viewers and, sure. and me as well as we go forward, just kind of try to understand what we're talking about. So first things first is space is not two dimensional. Um, this is a dimensionally reduced version of the block universe. So it's, it'd be like, what if space was two dimensional and we still had time because we can't visualize four dimensional things. So um, that's, that's an important uh, caveat. But setting that aside, the idea is that uh, left and right and up and down are going to be like, um, you know, places on the same plane of, the, uh, of, this, of this diagram. So like the slice where it says now, if you're existing in that now, the the other thing, something to your left, something to your right, something you know in front of you, back behind you, whatever, those are also on that now. Those are in a yeah. certain place. Um, so, like if we had um, if we had atomic clocks that were synchronized, they would say the same thing. Yeah, sort of. Sort um, of. <laughs> it's, it's gets. It's messy. Synchronizing <laughs> clocks is messy. Yeah. So, so the the thing that makes this uh, what what makes this interesting this this kind of depiction is that it suggests that like the past and the future and now are all equally um, real. Real. Yeah. And that that is a sensible idea because uh, basically in all of physics, what we talk about is we talk about um, you have I mean the whole goal of physics right is you you have some initial state and you do math to it and you get a final state and then you compare it with your experiment and if your experiment agrees then you did physics hurrah right the thing is is basically every aspect of physics every every fundamental equation that we have works backwards just as well yeah if you tell me what the final state is you can wind the clock back and figure out what the state was before that now that's not super useful for like making predictions and stuff but suffice it to say it works just as well and so the point is, is once you know the state of what's happening now, everything in the past and everything in the future, in some sense, is, is, you know, neglecting quantum mechanics and all that stuff, is uh, just as determined. And so it doesn't make sense to say that now has priority when all of the information that you have about now, you could have an equally large amount of information about 
the future or the past. They, they exist in kind of the same, like you have an equally good description of all of them. And so that's why you might say that they're all there. Um, what it means for them to exist simultaneously, again, we have to be really careful when we use tensed language because the idea of the, idea of the block universe of this, like, this, this theory of time, and I say theory of time in the philosophical sense, not in the physical sense, um, the idea of the block universe is that it's tenseless, right? There, there, there is no notion of now, before, after, simultaneously. There just is the block universe, and you can talk about one event being before another event within the block universe, but the block universe as a whole is tenseless. Okay. Which is a rough. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like, when, uh, in, uh, like, in science fiction, when you have, like, the concept of creatures that can travel through time, like the, the space whale in that episode of Futurama or whatever, is that is that an idea that you think nobody probably would have thought of? Like, is that a block universe idea that you can travel through time as a dimension and end up in different slices, parts? Um, I mean, time travel as, a, as an idea, I think, like, was it H.G. Wells? The, with the time machine that was that was like a book from like the or a story from the 1890 i don't know i don't know the dates but yeah the, i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure the idea of time travel predated einstein um at least by science fiction authors um the i don't i, I don't think that you need the block theory of time or the block picture of time in order or of the universe in order to have this notion of time travel uh and i should i should be super super clear this is not like something that is guaranteed by relativity, by general right. relativity. This is like a way of viewing things. And so um, this is a question of, uh, like it's almost a question of convention rather than a question of what's actually there. Sure. <laughs> like it, it, it's about the mathematical description of things, like the future and past and now are all equally mathematically real. What is actually real is a much harder question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I do have, I do have a question about time travel, but it's going to come, it's going to come up uh, more toward the end, I think. So sure. since we're talking about, um, uh, relativity, I, I, in doing my homework for this, I, I came across some ideas and I think, I think this will kind of help us out maybe a little bit. So let's set up this scenario. Let's say there, there's you, there's me. And we're standing like in the same place and a hundred meters away, there's a speaker and that speaker just blasts a sound. So it's going to take some time for that sound to get to us. But let's say you stay still and I move away from the speaker at like a hundred meters per second. So I will hear the sound after you. But if we, if we could do some math and take like my relative speed and we'd both conclude that the sound left the speaker at the same time. That makes sense so far. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So long as you know your speed relative to the medium that you're in, yeah, um, yeah. Then and you know the speed of yeah, sure. From what I understand, though, this works different with light. Like the future and this block universe idea. From what it sounded like to me, the future is literally closer the faster you move. Uh, yeah, sort of. Um, cause they so, take, l l sorry, I'll, I'll interrupt. Cause no, they say good, if we, if we take this diagram again, that, that slice of now goes, you know, across, but as you move, it can skew and it'll yep. skew uh, like away from the past, but toward the future, depending on what your movement is like. So, so when we talk about the distance in the, the distance of the future, remember it, what we're really comparing when we talk about, um, you know, uh, distances or durations, we're talking about the distance between events or the duration between events. Now, an event, just for those who don't know, uh, an event is how we describe kind of the position in space time. It's like the place, but also the time. So, you know, you would, you would tell me, it's like, you know, the way that you plan a party, right? Uh, fourth and sixth, fourth and main street, how do addresses work? Fourth and <laughs> E Street on the third floor at 6 p.m. Right? You have right. to specify three play, three uh, three coordinates for the space and then one coordinate for the time. So we talk about the distance between events. 
or it's rather it's called the space-time interval, which accounts for durations and distances. So it is true that the events that are in the direction of mo motion, but in your future, are closer. Mm -hmm. But it skews the other way. For it, it skews right. So the the events that are in the opposite direction, but the same uh, at the same time slice are further away. So the it, it, you, you can think of it as like tilting, basically. And so, yeah, it's, it's really bad. It's, yeah, it's just, it's confusing. One other thing, I thought of this earlier, I forgot to ask it, but um, th with this block universe idea, does this, does this mean that, now again, maybe it's just because it's a diagram drawn on paper, but does this mean that the universe has a definite end? Like, are all these slices, does it actually have a, like a, I don't want to say beginning and end, but like the, the block dimensions do. So like speaking, not in do terms I... of like time. Well, I mean, that's the way it's drawn. So would this imply that there actually is like, there's, there's a no. beginning part where it all starts to transform and then it seems to end. So no. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the basic gist is that, um, this is like, I mean, it's a picture of course. Yeah. Um, and you know, you can't really draw infinitely large slices nor can you draw infinitely long loaves of bread. Um, it could be that our universe is finite in size. Think like the uh, the surface of a globe. Uh, flat earthers, don't at me. Um, that's finite in size, and so you could uh, imagine um, kind of taking spherical slices that get bigger, but not actually big. Rather, you could imagine kind of gluing spherical surfaces together um, and maybe it goes on forever in one direction. It doesn't go on forever, forever in the other direction if our universe had a beginning. Alternatively, our universe just might be infinitely large, in which case the slices are themselves infinitely large, right. and there may <clears throat> still have been, been, a, been a beginning. Or maybe there's a beginning and an end, big bang, big crunch, but the slices are infinitely large. Like All sorts of uh, possibilities are laid out here. The idea is just that um, this is just to kind of suggest that the time is as real as the space. It doesn't say anything about the shape. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. So, um, going, going back to what we were talking about, I, I heard that and with those like slices of now and how it can be skewed and there seem to be like some perspective shifts that go on here. What I've heard is that somebody can be in your slice of the present, but you are not in theirs. Is there any way we can make sense of an idea like that? Someone can be in your slice of the present. Yep. But you're not in theirs. Oh, I don't, yes. I don't know yes, if that yes, has yes. to do with light cones overlapping or something like that. Yeah. So, so think of it this way. Let's say that uh, somebody is moving relative to you. They are moving, I don't know, really fast to your left. Um, and yeah, so... Wish I could draw draw a diagram. Um, yeah, I, I can't draw a diagram. The, the idea is that um, once they're moving relative to you, their now skews. So mm -hmm. their now might be your, their now, or yeah, you might be in the future of their now. So is it because theirs would be skewed, but yours is still yes. like parallel? So that's how, it, oh, okay. Because you yep. can't look out and see them, but they're looking this way and seeing you. Well, you know, whether you can way. see them is a very different thing. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, so... They're so just there. You, you actually can't interact with things that are in your now. Mm -hmm. Which is weird to think about, right? If something yeah. is in your now, that means that it is a distance away from you, but at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. In order to interact with something, you have to go to it, and that takes time. So you can yep. only interact with things that are uh, sufficiently close to you sufficiently far away in the future. Um, but yeah, the idea is that they could be passing through your now, or even they could even be, well, okay, if they're passing through the same place as you, then um, you'll both be in, e be in each other's nows. But sure. the moment you're at different places, um, yeah, let, let me just find something. Oh, here we go, glasses, right. Um, so uh, this is your now, this is their now. Yep. So, the idea is that they might be, uh, this is, it's terrible. 
basically, what all you want to do is you just want to draw two points. Um, can I get a diagram? Can I just draw a picture? Yeah. I'm going to draw a picture. And hold here, so your slice of now is the straight line here. Mm -hmm. They can be in it, but their now is going to be slightly tilted. So if you look at their now, that would be you in the past. And that's because um, they're moving or because they're in a different place and it takes time? Moving. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, implicit, here, implicit here is that they're moving yep. in some direction. <clears throat> um, and we could figure out what direction they're moving in from the diagram if we wanted to. But it's not, it's not relevant. The point is, is that... Um, th is that you will be in there now in their future. So this line will move up and then it'll intersect your now, which, so, which is to say that the nows of people are relative, which is why that diagram, the, uh, the block universe diagram, um, that now only makes sense for you. Everybody else's now will be different. Um, yeah. Now, if they're not moving relative to you, then you'll agree, assuming that there's not strong gravity or anything. But if anybody's moving, their now is going to be tilted, and now it's a different now from your now. Awesome. Okay, I think I kind of, I kind of get. I thought that that maybe meant something super profound or, or weird, but it, it, it makes a little bit of sense at least. I mean, it, it kind of is in that um, it doesn't make sense to talk about what somebody else is doing now far away yeah right like because like you, you could say you like, can't know well and it doesn't even mean anything because if they're moving what now is to you and what now is to them are different yeah also true also true um unless you're entangled and then you know instantly or something i don't know <laughs> uh, don't um, get me started <laughs> do you know the history or the uh youtube channel history of the universe i don't oh it's i i uh put it on when i want to fall asleep they do stuff like they have a video that came out i don't know when it came out but i watched part of it this morning and it's just called is now real i think is what it's titled uh i think i think they do a really good job you're you're an expert so you might think that some of the stuff they say is like because eh. like they do stuff on the the very earliest moments of of the big bang and what is what will deep cosmic time look like and uh, parallel universes and multiverse. And it's it's really cool stuff. But um, they talk about, <clears throat> I don't know if this is necessarily related to the block universe, but it's definitely part of relativity. So they talk about these Lorentz transformations and they, they kind of floated this idea and then walked away from it. And I was very unsatisfied. So the classic thought experiment, uh, I think you know this is, you're you're on a train and lightning strikes two trees at the same time. Yep. So Rel wait for who? Well, well, yeah. Oh, so this is the idea. It it just all they really said was that it does. Like a person standing on the ground sees it happen at the same time. Yep. But if you're in the train and you're moving, well, you're moving toward one tree and away from the other. So you will see lightning strike one tree yep. before the other, but they said, and that makes perfect sense to me, but they said that that violates the law of causality um, because one person saw the lightning strike the trees at the same time. But if you see it differently, that would imply that it actually, that those events didn't happen simultaneously. And then they just stopped. And I was like, wait, yeah, that seems like a huge problem actually. So, there's this thing in relativity, which is the like time dilation, no big deals, uh, Lorentz contraction, no big deal. Relativity of simultaneity is the most confusing thing, hmm. um, which is to say, uh, it's just very, it's it's very, very, very weird. Um, there's a so so what it, it 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 is not the case that two spatially separated events. If they're simultaneous in one frame, they're simultaneous in every frame. I don't know why they would say that violates causality. Um, so it just can't be the case that you can see simultaneous events in all reference frames happen simultaneously. Uh, yeah, I mean, okay. in fact, there's a, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna get this wrong because it's been a while since I've even, I've, I've thought seriously about like special relativity things. Um, there's a thought experiment that the idea is that imagine that you have like a ladder. Um, that is uh, wider than a barn. And the barn has two doors. The ladder is moving through the barn. So from um, from the standpoint of somebody who is just sitting in the same rest frame, uh, 
of the barn, um, and when the ladder's at rest, the barn can't fit, sorry, the ladder can't fit inside the barn. It's too wide. Yeah. Right? But if the barn's, if the ladder's moving, well, from the, uh, from the, if the ladder's moving, from the barn's perspective, if it's moving fast enough, the ladder will shrink, Lorenz contraction, yeah. so that it act, so that you can close both doors at the same time while it's inside. Interesting. The question is, from the ladder's perspective, the barn gets smaller, Lorenz contraction. So it would seem like, well, how do you close both doors simultaneously when the ladder is bigger than the barn? It would like get the, the doors would hit the ladder. And the idea is that what's simultaneous in one frame, in the barn's frame, is not simultaneous, closing the doors at the, at the same time, is not simultaneous in the other frame. And so this, this, this is very similar to the lightning striking a tree thing. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, it makes it make a <clears throat> lot less sense when you start considering the barn ladder paradox, uh, which is resolved quite easily just by considering the various uh, space-time coordinates and when things happen in various frames. Okay, so when they said this violates causality, you think that that was like unwise to say? I mean, I'd have to go watch the video. I'm, I'm not going to say that they said something super, super wrong, but like, um, yeah, relativity is like definitionally a causal theory. So, unless you have closed time like curves, which is a separate thing. Uh, <laughs> okay, but you know what I just thought of? Um, you should make sure. a you should make a video on this. Uh, because I think this would actually be awesome. So we could, this could be a, do you know the what if books by Randall Monroe? Yep. He, he should, he should put this in his what if he's made what if one and two for three, he should do this. So you know, like the rigged carnival game where you try to throw a ball through a hoop, but the ball's actually bigger than the hoop. Uh, no, but I could believe it exists. It's, yeah, it's existed before. Like you win a prize if you can fit it through the the hole in the wall or whatever. Now, if you threw that ball close enough to the speed of light, would it change? Nope. Uh, because when it's it, the other, it's the wrong. It's the wrong dimension. It's it's so only like uh, happens okay. in the direction of travel. Yeah. So um, e even if you threw it at a slant in one of those directions, it would still be. Uh, so you couldn't squash the ball to fit through the hole, huh? No, unfortunately not. That's um, unfortunate. Well, I although, guess. So it, in, interestingly those enough, those carnies—they've thought of, of everything. I know, right? That's insane. You, you can't even—you can't even just like powerball it and get it in <laughs> the Lorentz contraction, right? Interestingly enough, there is an interesting consequence of Lorentz contraction involving um, spheres, not balls. <laughs> There's an interesting consequence, namely um, nuclei, atomic nuclei. Uh, in relative, the, there's there's a type of particle collider called a relativistic heavy ion collider. They basically take big nuclei like lead, gold, big chunky nuclei. That's the heavy ion part. Yeah. Ionize it so that it's just the nucleus, and it's charged so they can accelerate it, and then they just smash them into each other. This is how we simulate the early universe uh, called quark, quark, quark gluon plasmas, all this stuff. But interestingly enough, if you didn't take into account relativity, you would just have two spheres of a certain density passing through each other and sometimes colliding. But what actually happens, if you want to make the math work out, is that the spheres in the lab frame, the nuclei flatten into pancakes. Oh, wow. And so their density actually increases, and so they interact more frequently. Oh. Which is, like, this is, this is one of the, uh, a lot of people will say, like, oh, well, how do you actually prove Lorentz contraction is a thing? This is one way to do it. Muons, muons prove it too, right? Because that proves that proves uh, time dilation. Um, I thought the contract. So the so the tricky thing about the muons is that it does prove Lorentz contraction if you're in the muon rest frame, but nobody's oh, okay. ever been in that rest frame. <laughs> so from in the lab frame, we only see the time dilation. We on, we only see the the clock on the muon going slower. But this is an example where you can actually see the Lorentz contraction in an indirect way uh, in the lab frame, which is kind of neat. That is really cool. Um, huh. Interesting. I should make a video about that. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, I thought of... Oh, since we're talking about Lorentz contractions, so basically there's there's a graph you can look at where like the faster you're moving, the slower through time you're moving compared to somebody else. Um, like, and I, I, I was looking at that and like if you're traveling 99% the speed of light, the I don't know what's called the Lorentz factor or something is seven yep. I think, sure. Um, but then for every like tenth of a percent you go from there it increases 
a lot. Why is it why is it like a um asymptotic and not linear? Well, it's because you can't go faster than the speed of light. Uh well that is kind of a cop out answer. Um so yeah. The 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 idea is just roughly that there is a um how do I want to phrase this? So it kind of stems from this uh this strange thing that the thing that is held the same regardless of reference frame is something called the space-time interval. So if you take two events, the space-time interval between them, at least in special relativity and general relativity, this is trickier. But the space-time interval between them, it's just a number. It's positive, negative, whatever it might be. Um, it's just a number, maybe at zero. Um, but the point is, is that is held fixed. But that's not like the distance plus the time or something like that. It's actually something like the duration minus the distance. And so the way to think about space-time, at least flat space-time without gravity, again, because that ruins everything, is that um, the thing that makes space and time different is that, sp is that there's, this, there's this minus sign in there. And so typically, we would think about um, changing frames. It, like If you just wanted to kind of change your perspective in a spatial way, you could like imagine rotating in every which, any, any which way. And so what a rotation does is it holds the... Um, it basically holds the distance the same. So regardless of how much you rotate, if you measure the distance between two things, regardless of the angle that you look at it from, it's always going to be the same distance, right? The, the same kind of, these are called symmetry transformations, by the way, like the kinds of things that you can do without changing something. The kinds of, um, trans, the tr kinds of things that you can do in space time, where you have this kind of change in, it's, a, it's called signature, the change in sign, you have a minus sign in how you measure space time intervals. These are the Lorentz transformations rather than rotations. Um, and so uh, if you basically try to figure out what would, what can I do to, uh, what can I do to a frame so that the duration minus, it's really the duration squared, it's like, it's like Pythagorean theorem, right? The space time interval squared is the duration squared minus the distance squared. So if you ask what can I do to preserve that quantity, but still, you know, rotate around in space time or whatever. It turns out that you don't just have cosines and sines, which is how you get rotations in normal spatial dimensions. You have hyperbolic cosines and hyperbolic sines, and it turns out that these are precisely the kinds of things that asymptote. Oh, it's it's a long-winded explanation, but it basically comes from the fact that space and time are kind of different, and the relationship between them is the speed of light. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I suppose if it was linear, then you would just get to the speed of light, but you don't ever get to speed of light. You get infinitely, you can get infinitely close, but never actually get there. Yeah. Um, let's see what I have next. Um, are there any, one of my questions was like, are there any experimental, is there like any experimental evidence that specifically points to a block universe or is it just a matter of like interpretation and understanding the math behind relativity? Um, or can you think of a way in which you could try to validate it? Yeah, I don't think you could. Okay. Um, I didn't think so, but ah, so so there is there is one possible way that you could falsify it. Um, if in principle the universe were uh. Uh, space time wasn't continuous if like at a, at a like a deep quantum level it was like dis discretized or something and if it were also the case that the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics were true which in principle you could validate just by like observing wave function collapse um, then you would have reason to think that like the future doesn't exist because it's just not yet determined oh okay <clears throat> um, I suspect that that'll never be done <laughs> because yeah. I, I don't think the Copenhagen interpretation is true I, I, I knew that I knew that I knew you were a many worlds guy and which we're actually going to get to that uh, before too long. Actually, we we kind of get to it right now because um, as I was doing my homework about this, they kind of uh, PBS Space Time has some cool videos about this and they say, well, maybe quantum mechanics is going to have to kind of come to the rescue, you know, in a way for this block universe idea. So with respect to quantum mechanics, we'll get into Copenhagen and then we'll do many worlds, but uh, just sort of like as a housekeeping thing, cause this is something I always have to like be reminded of multiverse and many worlds. They're not the same thing at all. Um, 
Could we like simplify what the difference is real quick between them? I think I kind of know it, but I don't want to guess. Sure. So many worlds is uh, the worlds aren't universes. They're like worlds in a more colloquial sense. There's like stuff going on, and that's the world. And so when so the the idea of many worlds is that like everything's happening here in this one universe. There's just like overlapping stuff that can't interact with each other and each each layer that is overlapping the other layer just like actually sean carroll wrote in one of his books the way to think about it is like you can imagine like if ghosts were real you can imagine that there's like a ghost world here and they have like ghost stores and ghost schools and ghost planets and stuff and they go about their life doing ghost things they don't interact with us we go about our lives doing not ghost things but we're in the same place so that that's kind of what the many worlds would be like that that there's just like like ghost worlds in the same place just of people doing other things from quantum branching. Anyway, multiverse thing is like a cosmology thing. It's like this, I, well, depends on who you ask, but it's this idea that, you know, there's other like pocket universes that are um, separated in at least the multiverse idea for eternal inflation. There are many multiverse ideas, but the multiverse idea of internal inflation is that you have big bang, a big bang that happens um, and it starts to expand, but the rest of the universe is expanding so quickly that the the vacuum collapse that caused the Big Bang can't outrun the expansion of the universe. So you basically have universe with a whole bunch of empty stuff, a, a empty space beyond it, and then another one pops up, and the space between them expands so quickly that they never touch. Those are bubble universes? Yeah, that's the idea. Okay, okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> I think that kind of... I, th I thought my idea of what uh, Many Worlds was was that like all possible perturbations or measurements of the of the wave function like i've heard it never actually collapses all of the all of the like possibilities in it sort of simultaneously exist but i thought yep. the kind of idea was that is like like a almost like a parallel universe where well where you got that measurement happens and this one happens but we're saying that they all just sort of overlap the, well the way to think about this is like the same thing happens to our universe as happens to an electron when it's a when it's in a superposition of up and down right we we wouldn't say that like you have an electron it's in a, it's partially up partially down we wouldn't say that like the up part is in a separate universe from the down part it's just kind of in a combination of the two yeah okay it's that, that that's the idea it's just our universe is the whole thing is is, is in a combination of the universes Okay, that makes perfect sense. Um, so, would so many worlds would not mean that there are many block universes. There would just be one. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you would have just the one block. Okay. Well, again, this is assuming that general relativity is true at oh, okay. like the deepest level. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's true to classical. It's true in the sense that like it's it's a theory that models certain things. But um, you know, if general relativity breaks down at the quantum level, and you have you know quantum gravity, and so you you discretize space time, and you know it, who knows what goes on in that case. Assuming that we can just kind of apply quantum mechanics, like just do quantum mechanics in a world where general relativity is true, then yeah, you would just end up with if many worlds is true, you would end up with just um, a whole bunch of kind of ghost universes sitting on top of each other, it, like in a super you. You have a superposition of blocks, basically. Interesting. So would you call those separate realities in one universe? Or I, I think that the word world is actually pretty good. Um, I mean, reality works too. Um, yeah. Yeah. World, world reality, whatever. Um, would multiverse mean that there are multiple blocks? Uh, like, so, could those both be true? I'm just asking, like, could they both be true, or would it have to well, be yeah, different? So, well, okay, no, actually. The, <laughs> yes, in a very boring way. Oh, so, okay. really, if, if the bubble universe thing is true, like the eternal inflation thing, there's one giant block that has all of the bubble universes with their own, uh, basically having a tube that's getting bigger, but that's getting bigger... <laughs> in a way that so they never touch and so you could treat each of those separate universes as their own block but they're all still they're just like a piece of like the whole block right mm -hmm. so you know in some sense no there's it's just the one universe i mean 
there's not really and i could be wrong here but there's not really like a useful notion of like a separate universe it's just when you talk about multiverses or eternal inflation bubble universes you just expand what you mean by universe sure okay i i think that makes sense okay so <clears throat> We'll take our block universe and we'll we'll say the, the past, now, and the future are all equally real or whatever. Um, to me, what that one thing that that sort of implies is that wouldn't that mean that the if the future is just as real as the present, wouldn't that mean that the wave functions are already collapsed? Um, because I thought like quantum mechanics is supposed to be like fundamentally indeterminate and based on the homework i did this is this is what the copenhagen interpretation of would mean for a block universe yes uh so the copenhagen and maybe i'm wrong here but my understanding is that the copenhagen interpretation basically says the block universe just isn't true um yeah because, be because the, if it's indeterminate but the right. future is just as real as the present then that means the wave functions are already collapsed so that's, yeah, that's where I was like, it would say that it's not true. Yeah, like you said. Yeah, yeah. So, but, you know, um, even the people who believe the Copenhagen interpretation don't really believe the Copenhagen interpretation <laughs> in the sense that that uh, most of the people that my understanding is most, most of these people um, take the Copenhagen interpretation to mean, look, this is like a good enough way of thinking about it and we just don't know what the deeper theory actually looks like there's like people i believe in compatibilism for like free will or something <laughs> um so that is kind of interesting because earlier if it, like could we prove or disprove the block universe like in a way if we yeah. if we if copenhagen definitely was true it would seem to imply that well it could be that the emerging block universe is true Right, yeah, we're like yeah, yeah. that. that we're... One is still fine. Okay, okay. So that's that's cool. We could we could make some ground. We could we could erase part of the circle of ignorance. That's a fancy yep. analogy that I use sometimes. Now, then, from what I from the homework I did, many worlds says that we have this thing called decoherence, where what I wrote down is all realities become entangled. So if that's wrong, correct me. And also, what the hell does this even mean? <laughs> yeah, so decoherence is tricky. The idea of decoherence is that you, if you... So w when you have wave function collapse, wh whatever whatever that might be, what this means is that you had, a, you had a, um, in a system that was in some sort of quantum superposition, and then um, you did something to it, and now when you go to measure it, it picks one of the possibilities of the quantum superposition. Copenhagen will just say, it just picks one randomly, and there's only one universe, and that's that. The, and and <clears throat> people, people who accept the Copenhagen interpretation will say, this happens because of decoherence, which I'll get to in a minute. But the idea of decoherence is basically that you, know, you have your electron, it's spin up and spin down simultaneously. You make a measurement. Well, nothing really happens. It doesn't, it doesn't select one of these. Rather, your measuring device becomes entangled with it. So part of your measuring device, now, now your measuring device is in a superposition. It's in the superposition of the dial reads up and the electron is up, plus the dial reads down and the electron is down. But now your measuring device, you interact with that, and so you now become entangled with the measuring device and hence entangled with the electron. And basically, as fast as light travels, interaction would spread outwards. Um, do, we so, mean, do we mean like quantum entanglement or are we yes. just using that word oh okay no, so literally quantum entanglement and so the wow. idea is that the idea is that you have um the entire universe just kind of uh in, entangles with that one quantum state the moment you make a measurement and so now you just have superpositions of the entire universe and wow. the uh there, there's this business of um of uh uh, the reason why it's called decoherence is because as the information of the entanglement spreads out, the amount of um, interference between the systems becomes harder and har harder and harder to uh, cohere. And w what I mean by that is that if you have an electron that's spin up and spin down, there's like a wave, in, in some sense, almost wave interference between those two. Like you can, you know, shoot it through a Stern-Gerlach machine and you'll have like some sort of interference pattern because that entanglement is con is 
um, or it's not even entanglement, that superposition is kind of um, encapsulated in a very small space. And so it's kind of really easy to, to account for all of the factors and collect all of the information to kind of disentangle it and see what actually happened. However, as the entanglement bubble gets bigger, you need more and more information in order to be able to actually see all of the, the, the technical phrases, relative phases. <clears throat> and so in principle, there could be some measurable amount, measurable amount of interference you know, between uh, our universe and some other universe, but it's basically exponentially suppressed. I say some other universe, like the other another world. It's yeah. exponentially suppressed as the number as the system size increases. And so we say that it's that it's decohered. Now they're in some sense they're now separate worlds because the probability of or the overlap of the worlds gets smaller and smaller as the worlds get bigger and bigger. Uh, whereas the overlap of the up and down states are they're like right there. They're, they're basically overlapping when when it's just the electrons. So that so decoherence is this idea that uh, as entanglement spreads, information is spread out too, and so you can't un you can't you can't untangle that information being spread out and for entropic reasons, basically. Um, <clears throat> okay, so my question to you then would be, in Avengers Endgame, when Hulk goes and talks to, what's her name, the, the wise one or something like that? The person who trained uh, Doctor the, Strange. Oh, yeah, yeah, the bald, the, the bald chick. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember what the heck her name is. I don't remember is. what her name is. So... Which which version of this are we talking about? That sounds like a many worlds thing because she she shows this split where she's like, well, in your real in my reality we will lose the war, but in your in your reality or whatever you will win the war if we do this. Yeah, it's sort of a many worlds thing. Except, look the the thing that gets that gets my goat, and uh, you know it only gets my goat because Sean Carroll told me that it gets my goat basically, um, <laughs> is. Many worlds isn't the, the like the de quantum decoherence doesn't happen anytime you make a decision, right? It's only it only happens when a quantum superposition is measured. So like when you pick up your phone, there's not there's no there's no fundamentally quantum thing happening there, right? There's no there's no superposition that's being measured and causing the universe to split. That's that that just happens in all universes. Oh, right? okay. <clears throat> um, or rather, that doesn't cause the universe to split. And so the thing in Avengers Endgame is that these are all macroscopic things that are happening. There's no superposition sure. that's being broken. And so <laughs> there are no other worlds in that, 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 in that sense. Now, oh, okay. uh, one thing that is, that is really funny, there's an iOS app um, called uh, Universe Splitter or World Splitter or something like that. Really? Um, that basically, yeah, it's, it's linked with like some like, uh, like lab in like Copenhagen or something ironic. I think it's in, it's in Denmark or something like that, where basically... <laughs> Anytime you you like click on a thing, it does like a quantum measurement, <laughs> and so 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 as long as you swear to yourself that the decision you'll make will be determined by the result of this universe splitting app, then yes, when you do that, there is one branch of you that does one thing and one branch of you that does the other thing, because then it really is a quantum entanglement thing that's happening. That's awesome. Yeah, the, <clears throat> but don't they uh don't they travel back in time by shrinking themselves? And then going through the quantum something. I mean, it, they're just making it up. I'm, yeah, they're just I'm making just it up. Saying, the, the, the quantum realm is the worst yeah. of, is the worst offense to physics in the last twenty years. Yeah, <laughs> it's Ant yeah. Well, yeah, basically, hmm. by making ourselves small, we can travel back in time. Apparently, for whatever reason. Um, Okay, <laughs> we'll we'll get away from that. We're going. I'm going back to time travel again. If if it were somehow possible to time travel backwards, then I feel like that would mean that the many worlds and decoherence, that would be the only way that that would be possible. Because if you travel into the past, you're going to change things. And so I feel like you would have to either create or travel to a different world. But I think, I think, I didn't know this until you said it, but just because you travel back in the past doesn't mean you're doing quantum things. You killing your grandpa is not a quantum event. So I guess, I don't know. What what do you say to that? Yeah, so time travel is probably impossible. Um, That's what I've because heard. Because yeah. of the problems with it, uh, the problems it causes to causality, um, the kinds of issues. Uh, there's some thought that like quantum time travel, like 
and I say quantum, like you could have like particles doing this at like the Planck scale where like time is loopy, but like at a macroscopic scale, it's almost certainly impossible for, for precisely these kinds of reasons. But yeah, it doesn't really have anything to do with the, uh, the, like you, the notion of time travel and relativity is like totally well-defined whether or not there's quantum mechanics. Um, and it's uh, even in just classical quantum mechanics, sorry, classical general relativity, it's fraught with problems. Even if there, even if quantum mechanics wasn't real, there's still so many problems. Adding quantum mechanics to it just makes it worse. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, man, I just thought of something really goofy, but I don't know if I can actually make it make any sense. Um, no, I'm going to give this a try. This is the weirdest question ever. So let's say, so a photon, because it travels at the speed of light, it experiences no time, right? Sure. If I, if I fire, can I, well, you can't, can you split a, you can split a photon, right? You can put it through a, a, a beam yep. splitter and they'll be quantumly entangled. Yep. So if, okay, this is really weird. If I send a photon through a splitter, one photon goes this way, one photon goes the other way. The photon that goes this way, let's say it like it hits something or like whatever. The other one continues traveling for a while and then way farther out in space, it hits something else. But because they're entangled, wouldn't that like in a way mean that the 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 photon that traveled really far because it's entangled with the other one, it could know something about the past instantaneously, but then the other one would know something about the future instantaneously because they end up in different places. So what will happen is that the, so you have your splitter, you have one going towards something, maybe it's a detector, right? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> the moment one of the photons, so keep in mind, it's not that you have two photons. What you have is you have a superposition of one photon where it goes one way and the other way. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so um, there, there's a separate thing where you can actually split photons into two separate photons that have half the energy. But, but when you just put it through like a half-silvered mirror, uh, a half-silvered mirror doesn't change the frequency. It doesn't change the energy. It just it gets to uh, a superposition of photons, right? So when you have the superposition of photons, the one, once you wait long enough for that the photon that takes the short route could have been detected, at that moment, it, um, at that moment you've done a measurement. Um, and so you will either know that the photon hit your detector or it's on the other, or it's going to hit the other one in the future. Okay. Interesting. But it's not, it's not as surprising. You're not learning something about the future. All you're learning is, well, it didn't take this route, so it must have taken that route. Right. Okay. So turns out it's just kind of boring. Oh, well. There is something else that's very interesting though, and I'm going to butcher it. There's something called a quantum bomb detector. Um, the idea is something like. Let's say that you have a bomb that goes off if you sh if, it, if a photon hits it. Is there a way, and you know, and you can't like use other methods of measuring it. Is there a way to see if it's a um, if it's a dud or if it's a real active bomb? The answer is yes. In fact, you can get arbitrarily. Uh, is there a way to see this without setting it off? Um, and the answer is yes. Basically, you stack a whole bunch of splitters. And a whole bunch of these kind of, they're called counterfactual measurements or uh, counterfactual detections. Um, and I'm going to butcher it. I, I made a video about it a while ago. It's really cool. Um, but anyway, the uh, <clears throat> you basically uh, split photons in a few different ways. And then you see if a photon was measured. And then if it is measured, then you block it. <laughs> that, it's, that, it's that kind of thing. Oh, interesting. Or rather, rather, if it's not measured, then you block it to prevent it from getting there. That, it's, it's that sort of idea. And so you can basically kind of stack a whole bunch of these. If you only have one instance that's like a square interferometer, if you only have one of these, OK, I described that wrong. Basically, you combine them, you put the bomb in the way, and then you let them recombine. And if, if, it, if it's a dud, then they will recombine and interfere, and you'll detect nothing. If it's not a dud, then they won't do that. Anyway. So if you only have one instance of this like stacked arrangement, you have a 50-50 shot. If it's, if it's um, either it'll go off if it's real, or you have a 50 per, it, like you have a 50 percent chance of it. If, if it's actually real, you have a 50 percent chance of it going off and a 50 percent chance of detecting that it's a, it's a real bomb and it not going off. But if you stack them, you can actually increase that asymptotically to 100 percent, which is really neat. Oh, that's cool. Um, 
So that's an example of the kind of thing that you were talking about. You can measure something without actually measuring it. Oh, nice. We're trying to hack the future here and and uh, solve solve many important problems. Just just don't ask me about the delayed choice quantum eraser, and I'll be okay. Because <laughs> it's not what really it, confusing. Oh, it's just confusing. Yeah. Okay. I, I we won't we won't go time, there. Yeah. I think we okay, did go there. You. The probably. last time we did, because we talked about I probably, like I probably gave a cop out answer too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought I thought the deal with that was no. We're, these are just two. Uh, you basically separate the wave function, and and when you put them together, you can see that they overlap. You're not actually changing something about the yeah. past. It's it. roughly that, but it's. It, I always I always it's not something I fully internalized yet because it's so counterintuitive. So I always just have to go back and look at references. Yeah. Well, we won't go down that road because um, I'm not ready for it either. Um, I actually only have a few more things here. So <clears throat> we've kind of tried to talk about the science, but what, it, like in your estimation, like what would be sort of like the philosophical implications for a block model of the universe? I mean, I feel like it would completely obliterate the concept of free will. I feel like it kind of... I don't believe in free will in the first place, I guess. But it also, I kind of feel like it it does away with all these arguments where like, um, oh, well, we'll we'll get into that later. I'll try to think of something for that. But what would you say are like the big implications for it? Yeah, so the, the free will one is, is a doozy. I actually brought this up in a conversation with somebody the other day. And they said, well, actually... Um, they, uh, there is a, there is an idea that you, there's a way that you could try to preserve free will, um, where, uh, you have a branching block universe, not a quantum branching thing, just like every decision you make, there's a branch for it. And then you, your free will lets you decide which one you go down, but the other one is still like, there's a you that makes that decision too. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically like the, the, the notion of the block universe and general relativity is that our universe is deterministic, that the uh, the the path that a thing takes is determined from the get-go. Uh, it's determined by the equations of motion in particular. And so, yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why I reject free will for the same reason. Um, well, I reject free will because I was determined to. Uh, right. But, <laughs> I didn't have a choice. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I didn't have a choice to be convinced that relativity was true. Um, <laughs> the, the other the other things that happen from the block universe is that um, it, it kind of uh, philosophically, uh, uh, the only reason I, I think about this this way is that people bring up this notion of like, um, you know, an actual past versus a potential. Inf people talk about like actualized versus potential infinities a lot. But in the view of the block universe, the future is just as real and just as actual mm -hmm. as the past. Um, and uh, so this this question of whether it's actualized or potential is it's gone. Oh, interesting. It's so but, it's not you're saying it's not one. It can't be one or the other. It's just. One. Oh, no, no. It's, it's, it's just people will say things like, oh, <clears throat> there are no actual infinities. Oh under the block universe view and given our current understanding of cosmology that the universe will continue to expand forever there is an actual infinity namely the future oh um but not the universe the universe we don't know the size of it, it might be infinite might not be oh, okay i would put money on it being infinite well i wouldn't put that much money on it being infinite but that's that's why I'm, that's where i'm leaning but you know we don't have we don't know one way or the other sure um <clears throat> You and I get in these arguments a lot where people tell us, um, well, in order to have a universe, you have to have a spaceless, timeless, immaterial being to uh, cause it into existence. This block, I would never use the block universe as an argument against that. I, I don't really think I would. But does this concept of like, does this concept, like, could you say to them, like, look, buddy, time isn't as simple as you think it is. This is a... This is a simple idea. It's very satisfactory, but it's not the gotcha that you think it is because we know much more than that. Um, yeah, so actually, arguably, um, 
these types of people we should probably like the block universe because then they can say, well, the block universe is where is uh, the universe and then some all-powerful being is outside of it looking, looking at it. But that's a misrepresentation. That's a misunderstanding of the block universe, of the idea of the block universe. It's not saying that like there is a universe and it's like in something else. It's just saying that they're all equally real. That, that that's why the pictures can lead you astray. Um, but I mean, perhaps more interesting, the block universe can give uh, explanations for the beginning that doesn't have a boundary. Um, there's a this is a thing that Hawking did um, in the seventies, eighties, maybe. Actually, it may have been more recent. Um, it's called the. It's called a. It's called the. Hmm, what is it called? Boundaryless or the the no boundary universe, something like that. Anyway, the idea is that you typically think of like, um, you know, if you wind the clock backwards, your universe gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and there's like a corner, and like yeah. that's the boundary. But you can kind of think of it as just rounding off, and then there's no boundary at all. There's yeah. no singularity. It's just kind of like round. <laughs> and so, so then you don't actually then there are no initial conditions. There is no uh, specification of data that you have to specify at the beginning that would require a cause. It gets out of, uh, it, it, it really gives you an uncaused universe, which is interesting. That is interesting. Yeah, I've always, <clears throat> I've always said to people like, like, <clears throat> can a universe exist where there is no time? And I, I don't I don't say yes it can or yes it can't, but I don't understand why it can't, right? So before before the universe before the Big Bang event happens or whatever, people say, what was there before the Big Bang? I sometimes just say the universe, possibly. Could have just been there. It just wasn't doing anything, transforming or whatever. And then the element of time as we understand it isn't present, but you know. There you go. Um, and again, I don't believe that. I don't think that's what happened. I've just never heard anybody give me a reason why that can't be. So there's this issue. So there's two separate issues here. One, um, we don't even know. We know nothing, less than nothing about um, what occurred at or prior to the Big Bang. Oh, yeah. So it could just be that there's just more normal universe before that, just normal in kind of a different way, but there's still, like, time flowing. There's still, like, um, you know, still matter doing or, you know, radiation doing radiation things. That could be the case that there's just more universe before. Maybe it, like, crunched down and then it, it, whatever, whatever it might be, right? Um, but the second question that also comes up here is, is what's often called the topology of the universe where we talk about like kind of like what shape the universe, what, what shape space-time has. Not, not what shape the space has, which is a much easier question to answer. What shape space-time has, which is a much harder question to answer. And you have to start asking, well, does it have a boundary? What, is that, what does that mean? Uh, what does it mean for it to not have a boundary? Um, can this, uh, the, there's also questions like, can the signature change? This is kind of getting at what you were talking about. Remember, the signature tells you you have negative signs for space and positive signs for time. If the signature changes, you could have the time signature or the, the the signature of the coordinate axis that we would normally call time. Maybe it changes to negative. And now you just have space in the distant past that for some reason fluctuated in some timeless way to become time. And so then you could have some sort of purely spatial universe that somehow there's a notion of becoming something. Where so so there's there's a whole bunch of questions as to what kinds of things can happen. This is all very very confusing and um, very much uh, not the kind of question that a lot of people actually investigate in physics. Oh, interesting. Because these are it's it's so far outside the realm of anything we have access to. Like like this yeah. is the kind of these are the kinds of questions that you need to have a quantum theory of gravity to even approach. The final thing I wanted to just ask was. Um, are there like any alternative ideas to the block universe, like in contemporary physics? I, I heard that like, well, or like different kinds of interpretations of it. I, we, we didn't talk about pilot wave theory, which I don't really know very much about at all. But from what don't I under, from what I understand, like if the pilot wave theories, how it works, that would be a block universe, but they said it doesn't work with special relativity. Uh, yeah, At, like I know what that means, but that's just what I've heard. So, look, uh, the the basic way that 
that you that we can think about this is that um, the the Copenhagen interpretation and the many worlds interpretation are both uh, basically both only require the Schrodinger equation. And so all of the things that we would typically do with the Schrodinger equation, like we, we soup it up to talk about quantum field theory, all of those things are totally fine. And so the many worlds, uh, Copenhagen interpretation, both of those things you can do. And by the way, quantum field theory is what happens when you glue special relativity to quantum mechanics. Um, and so uh, we can, so those are totally consistent with relativity because both, both don't re really require anything, anything on top of uh, the Schrodinger equation. Um, pilot waves does. The pilot wave theory requires, there's a whole separate equation that governs the, uh, the particles themselves. Rather, a uh, pilot wave is governed by the Schrodinger equation. The, pilot, the particles are governed by an interaction between the pilot wave, the thing that's governed by the Schrodinger equation, and something else. Mm. And there, no, there has been, I'm sure there's been effort to do so, but as far as I know, there's been no successful, uh, no successful efforts to kind of redo quantum field theory using that, uh, that framework of quantum mechanics, because it's a genuinely different thing. And so when we say it doesn't work in special relativity, we just have no idea how, if, if it can work even. Okay. Um, but you don't have to take the pilot wave seriously. The people who take that seriously are, they're just, they just want everything to be classical. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Uh, oh, well, that's, that's kind of cool. Um, okay, so there aren't, like, there aren't any other, like, alternative ideas to, like, oh, yeah, that a was block question, universe right? or anything else? Yeah, it, it was it was more than one question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, I mean, physicists don't really think about this a lot. Uh, hmm. It's like a philosophy of a physics thing. Because at the end of the day, um, whether or not, what... Is it because we need Regardless quantum gravity first to there. even to, no, 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 to, to even, even know what to do next? Oh, okay. So, well, I, to know what to do next about the beginning of the universe, sure. But um, <laughs> but no, it, it's it's that the block universe is if you're, if you're doing relativity, unless you're doing quantum gravity, which some people are, but most people don't worry. Nobody's doing the serious like uh, serious fully nonlinear quantum gravity really at all. Um, okay, that's all. I, some people are, but not very well. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the the quantum effects that would have on like the topology of the universe and all of that stuff nobody really has any grasp on. I mean, there are people working on this kind of thing, of course, but but like most of the time when people are studying, um, like what I do, most most of what I do is just relativity if I'm doing physics at all, and then I don't worry about quantum mechanics, and so everything's deterministic. So whether or not the whether or not the block universe is true, mathematically I can treat it as if it is, and that's just how the calculations work out. And I do my math and I get an answer, and great. If you're doing quantum mechanics. Again, if you're just doing quantum mechanics or just doing quantum field theory or whatever, you're not worried about the, you know, the topology of the universe, which is where this block universe stuff comes in. You just treat everybody as being in the same now, and then you do your experiment and you do your calculations, and then that's a few seconds later, and then you get an answer. And so, so nobody really thinks about this. There are people like probably Sean Carroll is actually probably one of them, who who do seriously consider like the, kind of the more philosophical implications of our understanding of physics, but it's not um, like I don't no and i can't speak for the entire community of course but like i don't see this popping up on my archive feed which is like an email list serve that i get every day I, there i don't see pay and i'm in the general relativity quantum cosmology uh list like email dump thing like i get all of the papers every day that people publish on those things and nobody's really ever talking about this that's cool um well it's free you can sign up for it you oh just, really I, oh i thought yeah, yeah. i thought it was like uh like a it's like a, a research thing or whatever. It it it, it is. Um, I mean, like it's it's a preprint server that people post their. Uh, it's called the archive. The archive A R X I V. Um, and you know, it's it's when somebody finishes their paper, uh, they submit it to the preprint the moment they finish it because then nobody else can scoop you. And then you submit it to a journal, and then it takes four months before they review it. So, I get an email list every day of uh, you know. 20 papers and I look at the titles and see if they're interesting. And if they are, then I read them hmm. and take... none of them are talking about the block universe. Right. <clears throat> How long does it take to read a paper usually? Well, uh, I tend, unless I, unless I absolutely need to read it for whatever reason. Um, I typically won't read it if it's less than, if it's more than 15 pages, uh, because then it's a whole day endeavor, if not longer. Oof. Um, yeah. so like, um, it turns out that older papers, uh, papers from like, I should say older papers and better paper, not better papers, older papers and more groundbreaking papers tend to be short. 
Uh, and so those oh. are usually pretty easy to read and quick to read. Um, so like eight pages are, you know, I, you can read a four page paper in an hour as, as long as it's not super, super heavy because there's just not room for a lot of math. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, uh, it really depends. Like there's this paper that um, I had to read for a paper that I was writing a few weeks back and uh, it's like 35 pages and it took me like four days, like nearly a whole work week just to kind of like internalize everything and really understand what's wow. going on. So when you say it takes an hour to read a four page paper, is that, is that because you have to do the math as you're, as you're reading it and that takes a while? Oh, uh, it's because, um, yeah, you, you kind of want to follow along with the math and there's going to be a lot of, uh, reference checking occasionally. Um, yeah, if you, if you want to follow along with what they're doing and really, really grasp what's going on, then yeah, it might take you an hour. You could just read it. Like if I'm making a video for TikTok and I, and I can just trust the math because it's by some famous person, um, then yeah, I'll, I can read a four page paper and. 15 minutes. It is still dense yeah. writing, right? <clears throat> um, so it's not that you can read it much. It's much slower than reading. It's like, it's like reading a textbook more like reading more than like reading a book. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it still takes a while. I'm also a slow reader, so that doesn't help. I'm a really slow reader. Yeah. I, I pretty much have to use audible for almost every book that I read. Cause I also, the world around me is too distracting. <laughs> I, I, I don't have enough discipline or whatever. Um, are you working on anything big? At the moment? Yeah, actually. Yeah. Well, I don't know how big it is. Um, I, I told you before uh, before we started recording, I had the shower thought, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, and I've mentioned this to a few people. It's, it's, it's very, it's, and I say, I'm going to say this to undersell it a lot or not, um, just to make sure I'm not overstating anything. I'm working on a toy model of quantum, of quantum gravity with a, a fairly, fairly famous guy, I guess. He has a Wikipedia page that counts for something. Um, and so, you know, I'm seeing, checking to see, does this toy model actually do what we want it to do? Does it, uh, you know, does it have any neat implications for cosmology? So there's, there's some cool stuff like that. Um, I've been stuck on it for two months. So the shower thought may have helped me make progress. I put some words on a page at least. So that's the coolest thing that I'm working on. There's other projects. There's a project I've been working on for the last year and a half. That's fairly large, um, it's just, it's grown from like, oh, this will be like a quick seven page thing. Now it's like 35 pages. Does a, <clears throat> is that shower thought, is that a conceptual thought or like a mathematical aha to you? Or is it conceptual? both? It's, it's um, conceptual. Okay. So, so the, the thing with this toy model is that, um, and I, I don't want to give away too many deals, details, but basically the mathematics of it is fairly well understood, but nobody's really thought about um, like, you know, like, like, in some sense, this this like this is like a mathematical structure that just exists, and math, math mathematicians like to talk about, and so they do. They talk about this, but nobody's really like kind of taken this and tried to like actual ma ma like see what actual consequences there might be physically, um, if you know if we take it as like a model of like a toy model of quantum gravity. So in some sense, it, it was a it was a conceptual thought of um, how I can how I can take like this mathematical structure and try to link it to to measurable quantities, not like experimentally measurable, but like things that you can conceptually say like, oh, this would, this, this thing would correspond to that thing in the universe rather than just saying it's just a number that has meaning or it's just a number that doesn't have meaning rather. So it was that kind of thing. Um, those are the hardest ones, by the way, the, the conceptual issues. And by the way, conceptual issues do come in mathematics as, as well a lot. Often you'll yeah. be stuck on a proof. And you have like you know a thing should be true, but proving that it's true is hard. Um, and so, you know, I've had at least three of my previous breakthroughs. I say breakthroughs in air quotes, but it's like breakthroughs in the sense of like I was stuck on something and then I figured out how to solve it. They happen in the shower a lot. <laughs> I don't know why, but they do. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, just I mean, for me, like well, I'm not a scientist, but like all of the all of the ideas I have, I can't think of any. But I, I've had a lot of. Oh, that makes perfect sense. But because I, I, I know most about like evolution and things like that, which is like almost all conceptual, it always manifests that way. I've never had a, sometimes like, cause I, I teach chemistry. Sometimes I'll be like, I'll do a lab and my results don't come out. <clears throat> they call this dog fooding in, I don't know why it's called that, but that's where like you do 
the lab or the activity before your students do it to like make sure that it works and all that. Mm. And I've done those before, like I'm doing a titration or whatever, and I go, okay, so this should, boom. It didn't do anything. <laughs> and a lot of those ahas come from, kind of come like to me mathematically, because I'll realize like, oh, I did a one molar solution of, of this and point five molar solution of that. So I forgot that I actually need twice as much or half as much, whatever. But um, <laughs> it's, it's very, I don't have any training or anything in mathematics. I'm not even great at it. Um, so it's just, it's weird to me to think of how a, how a, sh how a mathematical shower thought would come about. So the, the, the thing to, the way that we do physics nowadays is very different from how um, we kind of do it in this, um, well, at least the way that some physicists do physics. There are experimentalists who don't approach it this way at all. Um, but one way that, that, that it's approached is that, like, uh, if you want to build a theory, a theory has, and I say this all the time, it has a mathematical structure and an interpretation. Um, so I call myself a mathematical physicist because I do a lot of math. and That's, that's like, the mo mostly what I do. And so the, in some sense, math comes easier to me than physics does, um, than new physics does, I should say. Um, cause no, nobody ever tells you that if you're good at physics in college, that says nothing about how good of a researcher in physics you'll be, <laughs> um, the completely unrelated skills. But, uh, so, so the idea is for me anyway, I have this mathematical structure that I already know exists and I have a fairly good understanding of it, like abstractly, mathematically how it works. And so, but if you want to have a theory, you need to take your mathematical structure and provide some sort of physical interpretation for what those things mean. And so the shower thought was that piece. Now, mm. other people, I imagine they will have some sort of thing that they're trying to imagine exists or should be the case, like some thought experiment, something like that. And then they have to come up with the mathematical structure that maps on that, that matches with that interpretation. It can go both ways. But what I, the shower thought that I had this morning was of the former type. Okay. That's awesome. Um, I think we'll probably leave it there. Is there anything you want to add just in closing? Um, go follow me on Instagram. I'm, yeah, same. Put it in the description. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I'll uh, yeah, I'll do like a comment or something, uh, pinned comment or in the description for the video. We'll do that. Um, all right, sounds good. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.